it's a lack of moisture. He said, well, we've been getting some little showers at night. And I said, you are correct. I said, but look how the ground is cracking open. And that is a sign, a sign of it being too dry. Yeah. yeah and so yeah. just, just kind of uh, be, you know, out in the garden, if not every day, every few days, be observant. If you don't have a five minutes today, go out there and walk around and look and get an idea of what you need to be doing the next day or two. I was telling somebody this week, I said, you know, it's a lot more to gardening than planting it today and going back 60 to 80 days later and harvesting. Exactly. It's a yeah. lot of steps. <laughs> it's a lot of work in between. That's right. It is. That's right. So, As I've said before, easiest part is planting it. That's yeah. right. <laughs> you but, plant but, it and you got to start working. But with all that being said, when, when the temperature rises, that means that the moisture in the ground will evaporate quicker. So just make sure to keep a, a check on you. On your, you know, plants and stuff like that, and if you notice that they are wilted or whatever, it's probably due to the lack of water. And so, yeah, it's always good to have a rain gauge near your garden. That's, that's right, always sure a, good, a good thing to do because you get a good shower and you think you got, you know, uh, you think you got an inch, you know, because it came down so fast. But you look at the gauge and it's only says a quarter of an inch. Yeah. Uh, usually, a good rule of thumb is an inch of rain a week. Well, gardens. I was just getting ready to make mention. You had uh, made mention of that last week that the ideal situation is one inch of rain a week, but it doesn't happen that way. It may it may be some weeks you don't get any rain, and then it could be one week that you uh, have two inches of rain, and it may fall, you know, in just a few hours, and a lot of that may run off. So Exactly. So you do need to be careful and, and be aware of your soils, too, because some heavier clay soils are going to hold moisture longer. The sandier soils, of course, are going to drain better. Uh, loamier soils are going to drain better. And, and this time of year, when you're just getting the garden planted, the, they don't need as much water. They don't require the water that they will later on. Um, there's two things. Um, there, the plant's not as big. They don't they don't require the water. As they grow, the roots do grow into the soil, so they have access to more water uh, or more soil surface to get water from. But yet, there's more foliage. There's more there to support um, for for rain or uh, water, however you water, whether it's through uh, drip tube or overhead watering or however you do it. But <clears throat> um, it is a very crucial part, and it's easier to bring water to plants if you have the source for water than it is to get plants out of water or well or un areas that don't drain very well right. uh, areas that don't drain very well are very difficult to um, to handle when it does when we do get too much rain um, even though it, sometimes in the summertime it can be difficult to get enough water to the plants but um, I've always said a plant is, is better off being a little bit dry than staying too wet and uh, as Johnny mentioned, well-drained soils tend to, uh, uh, plants seem to do better in well-drained soils and than, than soils that, you know, are more or less a little bit more susceptible to water standing and, you know, high moisture content. Something else we'll make mention of, uh, it's an excellent time of the year to plant tomatoes, string beans, butter beans, sweet corn, pretty much anything you want to plant is a good time of the year except for your cool season vegetables. But get them in the ground, get them growing. But one thing we will make mention of, if you are planting sweet corn and you are wanting to plant several different varieties, uh, do not plant them by the calendar, say plant one variety today and allow that plant to come up out of the ground and get two to three inches tall before you plant a different variety because if you plant them any closer to that together you'll have some cross pollination which that's no real big deal but if you want your white corn to be white and your yellow corn to be yellow and not intermixed if you plant them close by together, you will have some cross-pollination. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, with sweet corn, it's, uh, you 
you know, some are better than others, but it's all good. So. Well, I was going to say, someone said, Rob, do you like white corn or yellow corn? And my reply is, first available. <laughs> first available. Yeah. I always somebody asks me that, I say yes. Yeah. <laughs> either or. Either well, look, or moving along, Johnny has got several topics that uh, he wants to address on the program today that's brought to you by T.G. Brooks Company, South Boston Memorials, and Owl Pride Foods. Uh, now, Johnny, uh, you just kind of take the lead, and I'll follow along, and I'll try to uh, retain a little bit of the information well, you're going to pass out. Well, just, um, just wanted to, to make note of a couple of ornamental plants that, uh, that we have in the landscape now. One of them is beginning to fade a little bit, but um, maybe in, in Person County still... They're hanging in there pretty good. This weekend is going to be tough on them because they like it a little bit cooler. Uh, but nighttime temperatures. One of them is irises. Irises have been beautiful this year. They've, um, we've had them at the house. We've got several different beds that have irises, and you cut them and bring them inside, and they just, they just make beautiful um, cut flowers. And last uh, for you know for a good period of time, not um, like some of the cut flowers do, but they, um, they last a while. But um, just wanted to make note of of those and. Uh, one thing that can can happen with them is is called an iris bore. Uh, an iris bore is a um, is a little larval stage of a of a moth that can get in the um, in the actual actually it enters through the leaf uh, and you'll see a little indention of the leaf um, with the with the bore where it enters the leaf and it goes down into the actual rhizome or root part of the um, plant. And it'll just eat out the eat it out. It'll just destroy that that rhizome. Now, by being inside the plant, it's hard to get something that's gonna kill the actual larvae once it gets inside. So, if you if you see it and can catch it before it gets down into the um, actual rhizome, then you can just cut the leaf off and, and get rid of it that way. But if you don't, and if it's in the rhizome, you just need to cut that rhizome away from the plant and, and get rid of it that way. Normally, it doesn't um, other than eating out the rhizome, uh, but it can also cause a bacterial soft rot, which is a, a very serious disease that um, it probably is the most serious in the iris. Um, iris is caused by overwatering uh, or poor drainage or too much nitrogen, but also uh, with this bore, it can cause, cause the, you to have soft rot, bacterial soft rot too. It just opens up a wound, and every time, anytime a wound is opened up in a plant, it just allows insects, other insects and diseases to, to jump on it. So just something to be aware of if you see a little indention uh, or some uh, sawdust frass or something at the, um, at the base of your irises, just something to keep an eye on is the, the iris bore because um, that can be a, be a problem. But iris is a very, it's a very tough plant. Um, you usually see the rhizomes or the, the, it's actually a stem that runs along the ground that um, that's how they you know, usually spread, uh, and they need to be, irises need to be um, divided. Uh, they need to be divided every, every so often, um, usually after they've, after they've bloomed in the, in the spring, you can, uh, you can divide them. They're very tough. I wouldn't do them while they're blooming, but other than that, they can be divided, um, and, and that helps them to, encourages the blooms to, to be better if they're divided and don't get so crowded. Um, also, Excess nitrogen could cause them to, to not bloom as much. So just be careful with the fertilizer. As long as they're looking good and, and blooming well, you really don't need to worry about that. But that's got some more information on the on the irises. Um, if you if you have any questions on them, just give me a call uh, or or email me, and I'll be glad to, to send you that information. Another plant that's beautiful this time of year, and um, probably one of my wife's favorite, is peonies. Peonies are, are blooming beautiful now. Uh, we actually have a hybrid peony, and um, one we have several peonies um, or peonies. I was corrected one time before. Uh, some places call peonies, some people call them peonies. Um, just go with whichever one you you feel more comfortable with. I, I grew up with peonies, I guess. So uh, the peonies, if everybody's familiar with that, so has a huge bloom on them. Smell just wonderful. My uh, my wife cut some. Just hit you in the face. They very are, fragrant. Very fragrant. Very fragrant. Very and make great cut flowers. Um, learned this year that if you cut a bud, it will actually open up. So um, it is a, a good.
good um, it is a good cut flower because it will open up even if it's at the bud stage so it's um it's a very very good flower to, to have uh, perennial both of these irises and peonies of course are perennial flowers so they will they will come back each year um, peonies don't really have any problems but a lot of people start seeing ants on their peonies right. um, they'll, they'll see this big bud this big uh, flower bud and, and then all of a sudden they'll see ants crawling all over it and, and when I was in the nursery and then even now I get people will say well, well you know what's the ants gonna kill my peony or um, somebody calls or calls me and says you know I had some peonies but I but the ants killed it ants aren't gonna kill it. ants are after the nectar that they put out the bud if you look at the bud there's a little bit of shiny nectar, and that's what the uh, the ants are are for. Some people say that if you don't have ants, then they won't even they won't open up because they 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 can't open up without that that nectar being eaten off by the um uh, the, the ants. I don't think that's true. I think if you don't have ants, they will still open up. But uh, it's nothing to be concerned about. If you don't if you have ants on your peonies, don't don't. Um, now, if you see a mound of soil right at the base of your peony and it looks like an ant hill and you tap it and just thousands of ants, be aware of those. Those are fire ants. We right, wanna, you, right. don't wanna, you don't want to mess with the fire ants. Um, don't see a whole lot of those in Person County actually yet. Um, I'm, I'm afraid they're, they're moving this way. But yeah, they, um, we, we, we've heard a few reports of neighboring counties. Yeah. That that has fire ants yeah. and dogs. I believe they're moving up 501. So and, and you know it may be some here in Person County. I can't remember exactly whether it, it, they are around or not. But I will tell you this much: if you experience fire ants, T. G. Brooks Company has a a, a granular chemical that will take care of them. And uh, I've heard some people say that you could you know put grits in the uh in, in in the mound and that would take care of them but then i've heard some people say that grits will not destroy a hundred percent of them but uh tg brooks company has uh the chemical for fire ants and if you have any kind of pest around your place if you're in need of uh, fungicides and things like that and that's something else Johnny people need to be doing is spraying their fruit trees wouldn't you agree yeah fruit trees definitely need to be um be sprayed now you know you can either uh, that if you don't want to spray your fruit trees then that's that's fine but don't expect to have good fruit on them if you don't in this area right. you, um, you can either have fruit trees that are uh, that will bear fruit for you and spray, or you can have ornamental trees in your yard, and they're fruit trees, but they're just going to be ornamental because they're That's not right. going to produce the fruit. So, uh, it really, they unfortunately they do require, especially peaches and um, and apples, uh, and even pears to an extent. You really do have to keep them sprayed. The only fruit that you really probably don't need to keep a big eye on as far as spraying is blueberries. Blueberries don't really have a lot of diseases and insects that's going to bother them. There is a, an insect that gets on the blueberries, but not going to harm them. Birds are your biggest problem with the blueberries. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, you do. You, and, and an all-purpose fruit tree spray is the best. Um, usually it's going to have malathion, captan, and probably caribou. Uh, Caribou, I can't remember, I've always messed that up in pronunciation, but uh, seven is the active ingredient in seven for all the years. But um, just remember, seven is very toxic to the honeybees. Uh, so if you do have that product in there, you don't want to spray during the middle of the day when they're out there foraging. But the um, but the fruit tree sprays, you definitely, that with the getting that captan, captan's your fungicide, malathion is an insecticide, and of course, the seven um, is, a, is an insecticide. And on the subject of seven, uh, you know, seven dust is still available. Uh, the water soluble uh, seven works well too, and it's not quite as harmful to bees. The thing about the uh, the seven dust, if a bee lights on it and then takes it back to the hive, it could kill a lot, a lot of the bees in the hive. But as far as spraying your fruit trees with uh, the uh, fungicides. Uh, some people say, well, how often should I do that? And it really just depends on the uh, the weather. You know, yeah. if we have a lot of rain, you need to spray more. If 
if you don't have a lot of rain, you don't have to spray as on a regular basis as if we do have rain. And hey, something okay. else, when we're talking of spraying, it would be a good idea for you to have a couple of uh, different sprayers. Use one that whenever you're, you're spraying weed killers, and then have a different one when you're spraying, you know, pesticides and, and different things like that. But if you use the same sprayer, triple rinse, and also um, they offer uh, a, a sprayer sticker. I think that's what it's called. Spread industry. sticker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've heard some people say that you could use you know, either like a, a, a dishwashing liquid would do the same thing, but pretty much what the sprayer sticker does, when you spray whatever it is that you're spraying, if the sprayer sticker is in there, it will actually make the model, molecules in the water more flat and they will stick to the plant a little bit better. But that's not 100% a requirement but just some folks prefer to do it that way wouldn't you agree yeah yeah and some some um, pesticides I'll say to cover all of them some pesticides require that more than others and some foliage requires that more than others depending right. on the foliage onions I'll take for instance onions if you're trying to get rid of onions and you, you're spraying it with a herbicide you do need to put some kind of surfactant in there in order to, to for it to stick to the, the uh, blade or the um, the onion better because it's so small and so slick has a waxy coating. Um, Good point. Certain plants, you know, if it's a clover, you know, clover is pretty wide. You know, maybe not quite as uh, much of a necessity. But there are also some uh, pesticides out there that just need a little help penetrating into the plant. And those uh, a lot of times the, the surfactants or the um, the spread stickers that they call. Um, and you know there's lots of different ones out there um, that they can that you can use but that some some pesticides just work better if you have that uh, mixed in with them I like to add them especially if I'm doing herbicides I usually do it because if you do get a rain two or three hours after you've sprayed that spread sticker keeps it from being washed off quite as much but that and that's a good point that you made with the uh, the rain you know if you get you know, a tenth of an inch of rain or something, you may still have some effectiveness of, of your fungicide or your insecticide that you sprayed. But we got an inch of rain last night uh, within a very short amount of time. And if, if, if anything would have been sprayed on any, you know, it would have been washed off. Okay. <laughs> that washes it off good. Hey, we've got a caller, Johnny. All right. Good morning. Thank you for calling the Gardener's Corner Program. Good morning, sir. How are y'all this morning? Doing well, and well. we hope that you are. Doing just fine. I had one quick Chris question, please. Okay. Um, last Friday morning, y'all were talking about the Japanese beetle, and it, it was something that you said you could spray on the ground around the root area of the tree to keep them off of your trees from eating them. Can you tell me what that was again? It's a uh, it's a product. Uh, several different products I out there you. that have this. Okay. I can't hear you. All right, ma'am, is, is that all the questions you have for right now? Are you there? I, I'm sorry, do what? Okay, is, is that the only question you have? I, I can't understand you. Okay, all right, is that the only question that you have about how to control the Japanese beetles? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, well, we're going to let you hang up, and then if you listen to the radio, Johnny will answer your question, okay? I'm sorry, it, it, I, I don't know what's happened to the sound. I was hearing you fine at first. Yeah, I, I think we have some shortage in our box here. Can you hear me now? I can hear you just a little. Okay, well, we're going to answer, answer your question, but we're going to let you listen uh, through the radio and not the telephone, okay? Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, Johnny, so anyway, y'all, uh, uh, the question is, you mentioned last week about a chemical name that can be used to control Japanese beetles, and you were saying that you use it in a drench form, drench correct? Drench form, yes. You, you, do have to, you have to do more than just spray around the plant. You actually have to, 
it's almost like you're watering the plant with this product. So you mix it in with um, a gallon or two gallons or three gallons, however much water it takes to get the plant good and drenched or the root system of the plant good and drenched around it so the so the roots of the plant can take up this uh, this particular chemical and it's in it's several different um, brand names that have this this now but it's called amidacloprid um, it's I M as in mom I D A C L O P R I D so it's, it's amidacloprid, and just look for that under the active ingredient for in several. I, I think Bonite has some, Fertilone, Bayer. There's several different products that have, or several different um, brand names that will have this product. So, um, so that is not a brand name. That is the that's, chemical that's name. That's the chemical name. This is the active ingredient. The and if you name. would pronounce it one more time. Amidacloprid. 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 I M I M I D A C L O P R I D. So, uh, and that works real well. But you do need to go ahead and get it on there, so it, the plant can be taking it up. So when the Japanese beetles come, chemicals to control them, talk with them right there. They've got a knowledgeable staff, and after you've been working in the yard and gardening all day, cap it off with some of those hand-cut ribeyes where they cut them to order at T.G. Brooks Company. A beautiful month of May. So glad that May is here and the beautiful weather here in Person County, and it's full-time lawn and garden season. Right now is the time to have fun and beautify. T.G. Brooks Company has for your garden tomato plants, all the most popular varieties of tomatoes. They have pepper plants, cantaloupe, plenty of vegetable plants too, like squash, cucumber, tomatoes, cantaloupe, also herbs, basil, chives, thyme, oregano, dill, cilantro, peppermint. They have lavender. They have your garden flowers like impatience, begonias, beautiful marigolds, vinca, petunias, and of course, hanging baskets. Get your garden seed. They're fresh and ready for planting. Reseed your lawn with clean, fresh grass seed. And they have the fertilizer and the lime. If you need mulch, man, do they have mulch, even the triple ground mulch. Do you need straw, pine needles? How about potting soil, planting soil, or cow manure? They have spreaders. They have aerators for sale or rent. T.G. Brooks Company serves the homeowner and the commercial landscaper. They handle everybody the same courteous manner. They can arrange delivery, or you can pull in with your pickup truck, your trailer, and they'll load it up for you. They have bagged products. They'll load them up for you in your car or your van. Remember, they have Bartlett Animal Feeds, too. It is exciting to see May in the full-time growing season. Top off your day with a hand-cut ribeye steak from T.G. Brooks Company. Hurry out to 411 Helena Mariah Road in Timberlake. Give them a call at 364-2428. T.G. Brooks Company has proudly served the homeowner, the farmer, and those in construction since way back in 1936. They welcome people from all over Person County, Rougemont, and Northern Durham, and of course, Southern Person County. All right, here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program. Our special guest today is Johnny Coley. He is the horticultural agent for Person and Granville Counties for the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, John, if you would allow me just a few moments, I want to make mention about Summer Fund 2018 with Person County 4-H. Uh, if you have a youth in your family from age 5 up to 18 years old, 
Person County 4-H has a summer field with activities and if you would like more information you can contact Michelle Van S at 336-599-1195 to uh, get the uh, um, youth in your family signed up uh, just to make mention uh, one of the classes is a safe sitter. Are you interested in becoming a babysitter? Come and receive training to become a certified babysitter and take to, you know, you take to uh, more or less the printout with you at home in a handbook and you will learn about uh, dealing with injuries, how to stay safe while babysitting, the difference in children's ages, how to care for them, how to prevent problem behavior, uh, how to run your own babysitting business, and more. Participants will need to bring a lunch. The cost of this is $20, and this class will be June 11th from 9.30 until 3.30, and it's open for ages 11 to 14. Then they're going to be doing a kitchen chemistry class, a citizenship focus. It's just a huge variety of different classes that's going to be uh, taught. Uh, gardening, the, gardening 101. I do have to put a little note in for that's Gardening That's right, Gardening 101. Get the date of that one. Uh, let's June see if 20. we can find it right here. One back. One back. Yeah, that's going to be June the 20th. June 20th. It's there going to be is. two sessions. 9 a.m. to 12 noon and then 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. and it's open to uh, children ages 5 to 8 years old for session 1. Session 2 is open to children 9 and up and it's a $5 fee and so get them signed up for Gardening 101 and if you've got a child that enjoys planting things and watching them grow uh, Johnny can help them cultivate their interest and grow it into something a lot larger. And we hope to have several different topics that day. We're going to try to keep the, uh, all the interest of, of all the ages. Uh, and, uh, hopefully there'll be something that'll that'll pique the interest of some of them. Maybe some entomology thrown in there with some of the insects. And so we're going to uh, cover a wide range of topics. We're looking forward to doing that with Michelle. But summer fun, 2018, three three six five nine nine one one nine five. And ladies and gentlemen, in true honesty, I think you would be surprised what 4-H can do and what they offer for, for the youth. Yeah. But again, if it's a child between the age of 5 and 18 years old, 4-H has something for them. So yes, it's it a good, great program. It really is. And I know Michelle Vanessa, when she was here a few weeks ago, she was just really excited talking about the different classes and she had reason to be excited because you know when you can interact with children and teach them something uh, I think it makes you a better person Johnny definitely definitely it, it takes a special person to be able to do that and to hold the interest of the, Child, of the children right. uh, with this day of technology that seems like that's where they want to they want to stay on is their their technology but if you can get them interested in, in digging in the dirt a little bit or uh, or, or even some pets uh, horses cows you know some some form of agriculture and, and and realize where they where it comes from you know where what agriculture is all about uh, we we have such a, a big disconnect even as even as adults sometimes um, there's a disconnect there between the, the agricultural uh, where where our, our crops come from or where our food comes from and um, and how it gets to us um, you know we, we don't just we, we do just go to the grocery store and buy it but it's a, it's a process to get it to the grocery store <laughs> and you know I think we're all guilty of looking at a, a, a plate with food on it and we do not envision that food any farther than it just being on our plate yeah. but when you stop to think about all the different steps that people has made to make that meal possible yeah. it is unbelievable it is it is and it, all the it different, truly you know, is the, the, from the farmer 
to the uh, processor and then to the retailer. I mean, that's it's, right. uh, it's amazing. And the food safety, you know, issue, you know, we've got the romaine lettuce issue that's, that's come been in the news for the last couple of weeks. But, um, you know, that's always an issue with all crops. That's it, right. It's trying to make the food as safe as possible. And that starts at the farm. You know, that starts with the farmer when he's planting it all the way up through harvesting. And then from then on, it, it really, really requires a lot of uh, due diligence on all parts of the process to keep food safe in this country. And I think that the number of, uh, of people that each farmer is averaged out to feed is somewhere about 150 to 160. And um, I happened to see something the other night on RFD TV. They have a program entitled Farm Her and they do features on ladies that's in the agricultural industry farming doing different things and it was one lady that was all uh, talking about you know farmer suicide and she said that uh, she actually won a contest and one of the contests was that if you won that you could have a thousand dollars donated to the charity of one's choice and she had the money um, donated to suicide prevention because pharma suicide is uh, a big, big problem across the country. Yeah. yeah uh, let's get a word on right now for South Boston Memorials. We appreciate their business. They are located over in South Boston, Virginia. If you're in need of a uh, monument, a headstone, a tombstone, for a loved one that is passed on, go see them at South Boston Memorials. Friendly people there to greet you. And they are located over on Seymour Drive. Here's more information from South Boston Memorials. South Boston Memorials, located 1439 Seymour Drive in South Boston, Virginia, has been in business since 1958. The Myers family of South Boston Memorials believe that every life has a story. For four generations, their life work has been to present and preserve that story for our prosperity to hear. Allow South Boston Memorials to tell yours. South Boston Memorials has granted memorials, markers, and mausoleums over 300 in stock. In-house laser etching is available at South Boston Memorials, and they can also make pet markers. For memorial benches, vases, and monuments, call on South Boston Memorials at 434-572-3859 or visit their website, sobomemorials.com. That's 434-572-3859. South Boston Memorials is located 1439 Seymour Drive in South Boston, Virginia. Like us on Facebook or visit the website sobomemorials.com. Very important parents. All righty. Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program. We just had someone uh, to call and ask a question. Uh, they did not want to go on air, but the question was, about all the little flowers that you see out in some of the fields, even in your yard. And believe it or not, these are in the buttercup family. And the technical name, I'm going to uh, allow Johnny Coley to pronounce <laughs> it because if I did, you wouldn't have no idea what I said. So. Not, <laughs> now I can. <laughs> Rhinoculus. Rhinoculus. It's the, um, the, the genus of the uh, Carolina buttercup is what... Uh, you see in a lot of the pastures right now uh, coming up. I know I've got them all over my pasture. And, yeah. and, and they don't know the boundaries of the fence. They jump into the yard. That's so they right. Are, they sure uh, do. They are, they are pretty unless you want to grow grass. And not, if we could teach the, the cows and the livestock to eat them, that yep. would be, we would have a good food source. Well, but. The reason that livestock does not eat them, I'm told, is because they have a bitter taste to them. Yeah, yeah. I don't and I've heard some people will say, I believe the fertilizer truck spreads them. It's not. It's buttercup. Yeah. It's just a, a wild form of buttercup. And uh, the way that you control them, uh, when we just asked Johnny the question, 
And the way he answered that question was... A spray and pray. But spray <laughs> and pray. But they do spread by seed, so if you can get them, if you can mow them uh, prior to seeding, to, before they go to seed, if you can get them mowed, that'll help control them. Uh, but a, a broadleaf herbicide um, will also control them. I've got a handout um, on my desk, actually, because I had this question earlier this week um, as far as how to control them. But... Um, the 2,4-D products, uh, Dicomba, I think um, Cimarron, and I can't remember the active in Cimarron. Right now it starts with an M, but I, it won't come to me. Um, and then there's, um, I don't know if Gray Zone gets that or not, but most of any of your broadleaf herbicides will get the buttercup, um, and you just need to get it on. If you can get it on there before it seeds out, um, that will get you your best control because... It won't. Uh, if you put a pre, I mean, put a um, broadleaf herbicide on them, it'll ki it will kill the buttercup this year. Um, but if the seeds already on the ground, it's not going to do anything. Next They'll year. come back next year. So you need to catch them before they go to seed, and go ahead and get those under control. But it is, it is a very difficult uh, plant. It's not you're not going to get rid of all of them in one year. I mean, you, you spray this year, you're probably going to have some next year, and just it may take you two or three years to to get rid of them. But uh, but they are they are a nuisance this time of year, and they take a lot of the nutrients because a lot of times you just put uh, fertilizer out on your pasture, and they're taking up a lot of the nutrients that you want to go to your fescue yeah. and some of your grasses that you want uh, your your cows and horses to eat or goats or whatever livestock you might have. But um, it is a it, it is a problem, and um, and the broadleaf herbicides will will knock them out. And Johnny, you said you had something you wanted to make mention of. I did. Um, Ms. Carla Johnson uh, with the very important parents program uh, that's run through the Extension Service has a program coming up next Thursday, uh, May 24th, um, and the, the program is at 10.30 and 5.30, so it's a, it's a program that will, it doesn't run from 10.30 to 5.30, it is, it's, uh, it's, uh, one starts at 10.30. And it's been an hour, hour and a half. It's decorating flower pots, decorating flower pots. So she'll have the flower pots, and you can come decorate them with your children. Um, and th th it's from it's for children zero to five years old. And when zero is the date? What's the date old. on this? The date is May twenty fourth. May twenty fourth. Next Thursday. A week okay, next from, Thursday. Is it a week from yesterday? No, be two, two weeks. weeks. Two weeks from yesterday, May twenty fourth. So May 24th, um, from at 10:30 they'll have one, and then again at 5:30 she'll have another one, uh, and it's for children from zero to five years old. So it's for the very young ones. Uh, come in and decorate your your flower pot. Um, she's got paint and, and, and pots there. She's gonna uh, help you decorate them. So it'll be be a fun activity. Uh, three three six five nine nine one one nine five for more for information. information. Yep, call the, speak to Carla. Carla Johnson and um, and just ask for for Carla and um, she can give you more information about it. But again, yes, three three six five nine nine one one nine five. Hey, want to make mention of Our Pride Foods, makers of Our Pride Premium Pimento Cheese Spread and Dip. Whether you're having it as a meal or a snack, it's good, and it's made right here in Roxboro. Well, that's going to wrap it up for today's program. We appreciate you tuning in. We appreciate the questions, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Again, happy Mother's Day. Uh, be good to your mom 365 days a year, but it, be especially good to her this upcoming Sunday, Mother's Day. And we appreciate our sponsors, T.G. Brooks Company, Owl Pride Foods, and South Boston Memorials. And we also appreciate Johnny Coley coming in and sharing his knowledge with us here on the Gardener's Corner Program. Appreciate but most of all, we appreciate everybody for tuning in to this edition, and we look forward to seeing you next week. My name is Rob Hall. On behalf of the radio station and TV Channel 10, we wish you and yours a happy and safe weekend.